Hi, and welcome back to the Mastering Your Fertility TV on YouTube. I am Dr. Haley Nye, and Kristen Cornett, unfortunately, is sick and not able to join us on this week's podcast interview. So today we are interviewing Dr. Jacqueline Chassie. So I'm going to read her bio to you real quick so you can get familiar with her. Dr. Chassie is a licensed naturopathic physician dedicated to helping couples conceive naturally. Her practice is Perfect Fertility and is dedicated to fertility, sexual health, and family wellness. Dr. Chassie is a graduate of Bastyr University, an avid writer and international speaker who has taught thousands of doctors the perfect fertility methods. She is the immediate past president of both the American Association of Naturopathic Physicians and the New Hampshire Association of Naturopathic Doctors. She's served on several boards, including the American Herbal Products Association and many others. She's a very busy woman, very busy doctor, and has done a lot for the naturopathic community as well in the fertility field. So in addition to her doctor role, Dr. Chassie's proudest role is mother to a bustling house full of children and slobbering dogs, and she just welcomed a new baby boy into her family who is now nine weeks old. They enjoy uh, family time together, including cuddles, laughter, cooking, gardening, and traveling. So she uh, is just amazing. She's near and dear to my heart. Uh, She was a mentor of mine when I was in medical school. I've taken many of her classes that has taught me what I know today. And I constantly go back and reference uh, her material. And if by chance you're watching this and you uh, are a physician yourself or a practitioner that is wanting to specialize in fertility, she has courses that she provides on her website specifically for practitioners and physicians. In fact, she's having one this weekend. Most likely by the time you see this, you'll probably miss it, but it's May 8th of 2019, Um, but she will have more courses available, and it's a great way to be able to get continuing education in this particular field. Okay, so what we're going to be talking about in today's episode specifically is all about egg quality, and we are going to be discussing the best ways to test for egg quality and ovarian reserve, the four factors that impact egg quality, how to test for these particular factors, and then also what we can do about them, of course, including integrative and naturopathic therapies. Hello and welcome, Dr. Chassie. Thank you for joining us on Mastering Your Fertility podcast today. We're so excited to have you on. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Perfect. So today we're going to be talking all about egg quality and you've been in the fertility realm for quite a while now. Can you give us just a background on what got you into naturopathic medicine and then also why you became so passionate about fertility? You bet. So it actually comes from my own personal experience as a patient, which I think is such a common story. Um, I was someone who had um, what's called primary amenorrhea, meaning I never got my period. So I was 13, 14, 15, 16. All my friends were getting their period. By the time I was 17, nothing had happened. And my mom said, okay, we should take you in to see someone. So I went in to see a gynecologist and you know, what they said was, okay, here you go. This is a prescription for birth control pills you know, just start on these, and then every month you'll have a cycle. And I was like, wait a minute, isn't something wrong? You know, doesn't this mean that something wrong, This my body should be doing this on its own? And they were like, oh, it's not a big deal. You know, just take these pills and you'll have a cycle. And I thought, well, what about what I want to have children? And he said, oh, we have fertility drugs for that. And so I walked out of there, you know, 17 years old with a prescription for probably orthotricycline and just a real big hole. Like, No one even wants to know what's going on or what's wrong with me. When why don't they want to fix the problem? Why are they wanting to just give me a pill for it? And it wasn't the way I was built. I always was someone to ask questions, kind of dig deeper. So that's why I pursued naturopathic medicine. I love the approach of find the root cause. And happy to say everything's fine. You know, I have children now, and you know, I have a regular cycle, but. That was a real learning experience for me that, you know, medicine in its conventional form didn't meet my needs. Um, And so I love women's health. I always have, and I always love helping people grow their family. So I really grew interested 
in fertility while I was in naturopathic school working with a couple in our teaching clinic. And, you know, there's really no good education for that in the U.S. at the time, at least. So I ended up moving over to Australia where I studied at an integrative fertility clinic in Sydney. And then, you know, since then have worked in the United States, kind of taking back what I've learned and really expanded on it and now doing teaching. So every naturopath or every doctor can know that there are kind of more natural approaches to fertility besides just IVF and, um, you know, that there are so many options available. That's such an amazing story. I actually had no idea that that's how, you know, you ended up becoming passionate about naturopathic medicine and, um, I'm sure a lot of our listeners can relate to that feeling like, you know, something's wrong with my period, but you want to just put me on birth control to solve it. But they have so many concerns about their future fertility and how, you know, why the, we've had Dr. Jolene Brighton on, and we know that, you know, birth control is just a band aid and it's not solving the issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When it's used as a kind of a hormone balancer, it really doesn't do anything to fix the problem. Exactly. Exactly. So we're, um, let's just get right into the subject because we have so much to talk about and this is such a huge topic. So first of all, I just wanted to ask you, is fertility declining in women? What are your thoughts on that with the research you've done? It is. Yes. So, you know, a lot of times when we talk about fertility declining in women, the first response is, oh, well, women are trying to get pregnant older when they're older, they're waiting too long. And that's absolutely true. And that makes it tougher to conceive. You know, age is definitely the highest or most like statistically significant factor with infertility at a later age, you know, higher rates of miscarriage and tougher time getting pregnant. But even when you look at the most fertile age ranges, like ages 18 to 25, fertility rates have almost doubled in the last 15 to 20 years. So there's something else at play for sure across the board, no matter age, even if you strip age out of the picture. Wow. That's amazing. I was doing research on this as well. And I came across this uh, research showing that even in develop uh, or developing countries, the infertility rates are on crazy rise, like way more than in developed countries. So that's an interesting thought there too. Yeah. And I mean, I think we're seeing like worldwide shifts in our environment. And I just read this really interesting article over the weekend that in Britain, they tested like the species of fish and found that a hundred percent of the tested species had cocaine in their bloodstream. You're uh, kidding. And this is like fish out in the wild. And it was at a very microscopic, like micro level, but they were testing what they call micro pollutants. And on top of cocaine, which made the headline, there were also tons and tons of pesticides, medications, all kinds of things that they found in micro doses in fish, in freshwater, in rivers in Britain. Wow. And like no doubt that kind of pollution is happening everywhere. You know, they had like ketamine and birth control pills and antidepressants. And, you know, unfortunately, all that's in our drinking water, probably in our food supply. And likely we carry micro doses too. And I think those small amounts are having a big effect on fertility for sure. Right. Yes, I totally agree. I call it the big human experiment. Exactly. (laughs) We're in a chemical soup. Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned earlier that women are waiting longer to have families. And I think it's amazing because we have more opportunity now um, career-wise. So yes, that's awesome. Um, But I also am hearing a lot from patients that women are spending their whole lives trying not to get pregnant, right? We're, we're just taught like, oh, you could just look at a man and get pregnant. And so we're on birth control for a really long time. And then we think that right away, we're going to be able to just like, once we stop that this mentality of like, oh, we're just going to get pregnant right away. And I don't think that there's enough, um, communication out there about how your fertility really does start to decline in your thirties, you know, starting right around 30 years old. Um, and, and what that looks like. So can you kind of tell us like what, what is happening physiologically to our eggs as we're aging? Sure. So believe it or not, the, you peak out at the number of what are called follicles, which is like a pre egg type of cell. You peak out with the number you have when you're in your mother's womb. So I think it's about 26, 28 weeks when you're um, 28 weeks gestation 
that you have the maximum number of follicles. By the time you're born, there's a percentage, I think it's around 15% that are already gone and dead. And as you get older, you lose about a thousand follicles per cycle. So that number just continues to decline with age. I think you're totally right. We focus so much on you know, telling girls, be careful you don't get pregnant, but we don't really tell them how a cycle works or the fact that they could only get pregnant on about five days of their cycle. So you know, we count on this like external approach, whether it's birth control pills or whatever, rather than knowing your own body. And then later on in life, there's this increasing challenge with getting pregnant. Like you said, it's like, we're not really talking about the full story. Right. Exactly. So let's dig in a little bit deeper with the physiological effects on our age uh, or our age and eggs. So um, there was a stat that um, you dug up, actually, I got from your work as that 35% of our eggs are genetically normal between the age of 35 and 38. Mm -hmm. So only one out of three eggs are actually genetically normal by that time. And then it drops to 10% once you get to 40 years old. Right. So it becomes more and more difficult to conceive. And then also when you conceive, the likelihood of having a normal, healthy pregnancy, meaning no genetic trisomies, you know, no SNPs that make it impossible to carry a term, all of the, those risks increase with age as well. So that the risk of miscarriage goes up, the risk of Down syndrome goes up, and those statistics start to shift around 35 or 40 which when I was 22, that seemed ancient. Right. Now, now I'm not anymore. <laughs> I'm, the I'm in the same still. boat. <laughs> yeah. And all of my friends and peers are, you know, we're all at the older end of women being able to get pregnant. So that does right. change. Like I said, with every cycle, about a thousand follicles get used up. So there's a, a couple of different theories of what happens or, or why cells age, why eggs age, why, you know, we have egg quality as an issue. Sometimes we think that um, every cycle you're using up kind of the best eggs that you have, the best thousand that start to hear the brain signal and start to mature with each cycle so that when you get older, you're kind of using up the eggs or the follicles that just aren't as strong. They weren't the ones that were called first when you were 22 or 25 or Mm. 30. So that's really one of the leading theories. And then the other piece is that there's so much in our world that we're exposed to that causes harm to our bodies. And it affects all the cells in our body, whether it's transitioning skin cells into cancerous cells or transitioning eggs and causing harm to our follicles and making those cells less, less quality. Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to go deeper into that. Um, first, let's transition into how do we actually test our ovarian reserve or egg quality? How would we go about doing that? Well, it's kind of a fuzzy science, unfortunately, as I'm sure you know. Um, But when I work with clients, we really try to get the best guess that we can. And I use those terms specifically because it really is the best guess that we can. There's no definitive test for egg quality, unfortunately. I think that's really important to know, though, because, you know, I'm sure you experience this a lot with your patients is that they'll come in with an FSH and an estradiol, which we're going to talk about here in a second but they just take it as like, this is it, you know, or their AMH, right? And and they really take it as a hard number that, you know, there's no chance that it's going to change, um, which is really unfortunate that I feel like other doctors that might be doing those, like gynecologists or primary care, um, are putting so much stock in those numbers as well. If they're like, oh, well, you know, too bad you need a donor, you know? Mm -hmm. So I've seen that lots and lots of times. So, you know, I think it is important to keep in mind, one, there's no great way to test. And we can talk a little bit about that. When we look at the test for egg quality, you know, if egg quality is your bullseye, you're measuring this and this and this and trying to draw a conclusion based upon the information you have, but it's not really a direct measure. It's not like vitamin D where you can run a blood test, you get vitamin D back and you know, right? It's a little bit more of an interpretation. And then the other thing is, you know, we have statistics around what, how bad is too bad. You know, we can talk about that, what those numbers right. look like. But, you know, as you probably experience with patients and I experience with patients all the time, things can shift and, and pretty dramatically. So I'm excited to share more about that. Um, so when I'm doing an initial evaluation for egg quality, which I'll do with anyone over 35, 
and really anyone who's been struggling, it's part of my initial workup because it can happen earlier to women too, not just to women who are 35 and older. Sometimes women have what we call premature ovarian failure or premature ovarian insufficiency. And I've seen that in women as young as 25. So it can happen younger too. Mm -hmm. Um, But we generally look at a couple different parameters. One is FSH or follicle stimulating hormone. The other is estradiol, which is our predominant form of estrogen in our body. And those two are always measured together, day three of the menstrual cycle. And then AMH, which stands for anti-mullerian hormone. And those three are the blood tests that we utilize to try to get a snapshot of, of what's happening. And that's kind of the first place we start with evaluation. Okay. So let's talk about the numbers on those. So where where's an ideal FSH, an ideal estradiol, and AMH? Great. So FSH, you know, just to tell you what it is, it's a hormone that's made by the brain. Um, and it tells the ovaries to stimulate follicles, follicle stimulating hormone. So it tells the ovaries to start those follicles in their maturation process to get an egg. And it's generally released in the first half of the cycle up until ovulation. And so um, FSH is made by the brain. You want the number to be low, believe it or not, because a low number is kind of like the brain whispering. So the ovaries are responding, they're listening. And even when the brain just sends a whisper, they start to do their job. Um, When FSH climbs higher, which we see in menopause, that's a sign that the ovaries are no longer listening. So it's almost like a bad child, right? And the parent says, clean your room, and the child doesn't do it. So the parent's like, clean your room, and the child's still not doing it. And the parent's like, I said, clean your room, you know, and the child is non-responsive. And that's what FSH is like. It's like a screaming parent. So we want to see FSH be low in the body. So we want it ideally, best case scenario, it would be below six. But anything below 10 is considered great. Okay? And when we see numbers that are up above 12, um, that's when we start to really be concerned about egg quality. And up over 15, statistically, if you look at research, the likelihood of a natural conception with an FSH of 15 is nothing, zero. So we really, you want to see lower, lower is better with FSH. Okay. And then I know with FSH too, like we were just talking about, it's like kind of a, you know, we're, we're testing all around and making conclusions. And so with FSH, I know it can fluctuate a little bit. And so how many readings would you say you would get of FSH to be able to make like a pretty confident conclusion? Well, I, I mean, I don't measure it cycle after cycle. I'll measure it generally once. If the number is you know, six or seven, or the number is 13 or 14, you know that it's going to be in that range. There is a little bit of variation. So if the number is close to 10, I would say 10 to 12, I might repeat it the next cycle to see if I'm getting the same numbers. But I would already start to take the approach to work to improve egg quality at that point. Okay, perfect. Now, the other thing is you have to measure estradiol with it um, because estradiol is a hormone that's made by your ovaries in response to FSH being sent by the brain. And estradiol, if when levels are really high, that tells the brain, hey, we're doing our job, there's enough, quiet. You know, that's like that child picking up and, you know, I guess their laundry hamper being full is a sign that they've cleaned their room, the mom doesn't have to scream anymore, right? So it's a lot like that. The estradiol tells the brain, quiet down. It tells the FSH, quiet down, and the FSH will come down. So if estradiol is over 50, on day three, that can be another sign of one, egg quality being poor, and two, that your FSH reading might be falsely low. Okay, so that reading might be inaccurate. So what we're looking for in that pair of testing is really FSH under 10, under six even better, and estradiol you really want to see in the 30s or low 40s. Um, if you're getting up above that mid forties, fifty, definitely fifty and above, then that's concerning. Okay, perfect. Thanks for that clarification. I think that's really helpful. And let's talk about AMH. Great. So AMH became very popular. You know, I would say five to ten years ago. Um, it's a nice marker. It's a, a pooled marker, so it tells us both the quality and quantity of follicles. And there's a couple different lab measures that are out there for AMH, but generally what you want to see is a number that's four or above. That's kind of optimal. 
you're not going to see that if you're 40 years old. Okay? AMH for above four is extremely uncommon once women are 35 or 40. So in a woman who's 40, seeing an AMH of about 1.5 is considered good for that age. Um, but the nice thing about AMH is it can be measured any day of the cycle. It doesn't need to be measured on day three, like FSH and estradiol do. Uh, but what we're learning is that it's also not as strongly correlated to egg quality. So the more recent research is saying maybe it's not as reliable. And I see that in practice too, because I don't know if you've seen this too, Dr. Haley, but there are women who'll come in who'll have an AMH of like 0.02, very, very low, who get pregnant. And then yes. similarly, there are women who have an FSH of two who don't get pregnant. So again, it's kind of one of those fuzzy numbers that we look at, but AMH is the one where if FSH and estradiol look good and AMH doesn't, I'll you know tell the patient, this one's not as reliable. So I think we're probably better off you know, using the measure of the FSH and estradiol, but you know, typically they'll kind of correlate or line up together. That's a really good point because, you know, I, I have had quite a few patients with uh, AMH under two and when they're consulting with like a fertility clinic, oftentimes they're like, you know, they, again, they put a lot of stock in these numbers. And so they're, they're kind of pushing for IVF and saying, oh, well, we need to, you know, push you along right away because you have a low AMH. Um, so that's interesting to know that there's newer research out there saying like, you know, it's, and again, that's not our experience either is that we've seen patients get pregnant even with a lower AMH. Right. I, you know, generally if AMH, if a woman comes in, her AMH is very low, like less than 0.1, 0.2, which you'll see. Um, if I can get their AMH closer to one, you know, 0.8 to one to 1.2, I'm really happy. And I see patients consistently get pregnant there naturally without using IVF. That's, that's so amazing. Okay, perfect. So hopefully if anybody out there has these numbers, you'll um, be more familiar with how to read them more in the holistic or naturopathic way. Um, Okay. So what are some reasons why women might have better ovarian reserve than others? And so we talked about this a little bit earlier about how some women lose their ovarian reserve earlier in life than others. So what are some of those reasons? Well, I think first and foremost, we don't know, right? We have some guesses, but we don't really know for sure. Um, You know, we think that it's possible that some of it's genetics, right? That some of us are born with, you know, different genetics that either give us a bigger pool of follicles at birth or that preserve our follicles a little bit better. One example would be if your genetics leads you to um, have really good antioxidant qualities, right? You can make a lot of what's called glutathione, our master antioxidant, and you can fight oxidative stress. Maybe that helps you keep your eggs longer. Just similarly, that same process, if you had those genetics, might stave off cancer when someone else that lives in the same neighborhood might get cancer because they, you know, you have different genetics going on. Uh, Other things we think are, you know, different exposures you might have had in utero and throughout your lifespan, um, it, that might leave someone to kind of burn through their eggs a little bit faster throughout their life. So the truth is we don't really know, but we know genetics are involved. We know epigenetics are involved, which is kind mm-hmm. of the intersection of your environment and your genetics. And then probably our own lifestyles come into play too. Yeah, absolutely. So it's really hard to know. Um, okay. And so uh, you mentioned the intrauterine influences, and I find that really fascinating because we have a lot of listeners that, you know, they, they've had no, they're not even, they haven't tried um, to get pregnant yet, right? They're just thinking about having a baby, um, but also want to ha- uh, give their baby the best start. And we've talked a lot about epigenetics and, you know, reducing environmental influences on uh, the pregnancy, especially in that first trimester when it can be really influential. And that's when the baby, you know, your daughter, if you end up having one, will develop all of her eggs. And so, yeah, so that's really important that we're finding more and more of this research that the, the, what you're exposed to in utero, in your mama's belly can really set the tone for your long-term health. 
including yeah. fertility. And that, and that goes for boys as well. You know, they're yeah. um, showing that, you know, smaller testicular size in boys and um, hypospadis, which is the, you know, the ureter is in the wrong spot and a lot of effects and they're showing direct links to environmental toxins with that. Yeah. There's, if you Google agouti mouse, A-G-O-U-T-I, there's some pretty amazing research. This is a strain of mice that's used for this kind of research. And essentially the mouse, when it's healthy, looks like a regular small brown mouse. But when it is unhealthy, when it has the epigenetic changes, it will actually become obese and yellow coated. So you can have two genetically identical siblings that end up being you know, obese and yellow or small and brown. And they do some, there's some cool studies on like BPA, which is so prevalent in our plastics. Hopefully people that are watching know at least to get rid of BPA. That's the first thing that I tell people to pay attention to. Right. And um, what they do is they, when they expose the moms to BPA, the babies that are born tend to be more yellow coated and obese. But when they expose mom to BPA and also give folic acid and also green tea has been tested and. Um, some other different compounds, when they give BPA but also a nutrient, they find that there's more brown-coated mice born um, to that mom. So, And that's when the mice are fed, the, the, the baby mice are fed the same exact food, same exact quantity of food, same number of calories. They're in the same environment. And even though they're in the same environment, they have different health outcomes, which that really opened up my eyes too. When you look at you know, why some people are healthier than others or why, you know, some people can't lose weight, right? When they're eating just the way that you would eat or I would eat, and we might lose five pounds and they don't lose anything. You know, a lot of that is genetics and epigenetics and things that have happened to us, you know, before we start that diet for sure. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, that's one of the reasons I'm so passionate about this work is I feel like it's really unfair for children to have to struggle, even though they're doing the exact same thing as maybe their siblings are doing or their school friends are doing, but yet they, they have to struggle because of something that maybe was going on preconception or in utero that they couldn't have helped at that point. Right. Yeah, so, I totally agree. It's about giving yeah. the kids the best start in life. It's not just yeah. about getting pregnant. It's about having a healthy child that has the best start possible. Exactly. And it gives you less stress as parents because, you know, it's so stressful to have a child that is struggling with weight or struggling with, you know, um, mental disorders or ADHD and asthma, autism, all these things. So it's really worth putting the time in now so you can reduce that risk. Yeah. Okay, we're going out on a tangent, but I know you could go forever on that. I love it. It's so box. It's like such a, it's a, I think it's just an important framework. As we were talking about improving egg quality here, Mm -hmm. and probably most of the people who are watching and listening are wanting to know this because they're having trouble getting pregnant. Maybe they're a little bit older and they want to know what can I do so I can actually get pregnant. But, But this is important, and I like to set the stage with this because it's not just about getting pregnant, it's about getting pregnant and not having a miscarriage. It's about getting pregnant and having a healthy pregnancy. It's about getting pregnant and having a healthy baby. And then it's about getting pregnant, having a healthy baby that can grow up to be a healthy adult. So it's really, you know, the work that you do, and it is a little bit of work or a lot of work to change your lifestyle and take supplements. But the investment is more than just, I want a positive on my key stick. You know, the benefits go far beyond that. Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree. Okay. So let's get back to egg quality. Okay. Um, So when we talk about egg quality, there's four potential things that could be happening that you've broken down in your research. And so let's just step through those four. And so the first one that you talk about is low androgens. So can you tell the listeners what androgens mean, um, yes. how we can test for those, like why does it affect egg quality, and then what can we do about them? Sure. So androgens are what most people think of as your male hormones, right? And we think of hormones in men. What do we think of? We think primarily of testosterone, right? And then there's another hormone called DHEA, which is a precursor to testosterone, um, but that's also considered an androgen. But a lot of people don't realize women also make testosterone and make androgens or DHEA, and they're very important for our health too. They do give us like our get up and go quite a bit, 
uh, but they're also responsible, particularly DHEA, to be a precursor to a lot of other hormones. And one thing we know that androgens do is that they help to protect or preserve our egg quality. So testosterone actually declines by about 50% in women between age 20 and age 40. So there's a pretty sharp decline as you get older in how much testosterone you make. And that can have an impact on our eggs. So women who have low androgens, that you can test for that. You can test testosterone, you can test DHEA. The first thing you should do to help with egg quality is to bring those values back up to normal or even the high level of normal to try to get the body to recognize them and process them better and help those eggs be good quality. Perfect. So we would test our testosterone and then there's free and total testosterone and then also our DHEAS, the sulfate. Yes, DHEA sulfate. Yep. Okay. Perfect. And so what would we do about that specifically? I know there's a lot of natural things that we can do. Uh, you have talked previously about, you know, some clinics will just give straight up testosterone, which mm -hmm. seems like such a great idea, but it's actually not <laughs> right. It's not. It's not. And you've and never used testosterone. No, before. I've never needed okay. to. And, and it's not really, I wouldn't recommend it, it's particularly if you get pregnant and it's a girl. Um, you don't want to be on any kind of extra hormones, you know, particularly testosterone or male right. hormones. Because when we think about epigenetics and the importance of the environment of the womb, you know, hormones are a big part of that too. We don't want to do anything to mess that up, you know, as the baby's in utero. So the approaches that we typically take, DHEA is by far the most commonly prescribed fix for low androgens, and it's available in a supplement form. Uh, most research uses pretty high doses, about 75 milligrams per day, but I've seen benefits even at lower doses. And I'll usually start at a lower dose because I find that a lot of women will have side effects at that high dose where they'll feel agitated or they might get headaches um, and feel just kind of amped up like you might if you had too much coffee. So you can start lower with that. Um, another option is using botanicals. So I love herbs. I use a lot of herbal medicine and there's some great herbs that can help to boost androgens. Uh, a couple of my favorites are maca. Uh, maca is so easy to take because you can buy it as a powder and it's not super flavorful. So it's easy to mix into things. So you could look up a recipe for like maca energy balls and you can kind of cook with them. And you basically use the maca powder like you would flour and you can substitute it out in recipes. You can mix it into oatmeal, put it in a smoothie. You know, it's very, very easy to take. And maca is nice because it's also... Um, really kind of an adrenal or energy support herb too. So people feel really good on maca. It's a nice energy boost. So that's one. And then another one that I use more clinically is called tribulus. And tribulus is given to men a lot to try to boost testosterone mm -hmm. levels. And it can be really effective for women who have low androgens also. And I think the only other thing that I would add to that is that about 95% of DHEA is made by the adrenal glands in women. So I don't know, have you done a podcast on adrenal glands before? Not yet. Okay. So your adrenal glands are like your stress managing glands. They're, you have two and they're above your kidneys, um, kind of in you know your back, your low back. And they're so important. They make cortisol and they make adrenaline and a lot of those hormones that we use for that fight or flight response. So when things can get dysregulated, and those adrenal glands aren't secreting hormones properly, that can affect DHEA too, which can affect egg quality. So that's one of the ways that stress can affect fertility, especially when you're under long-term chronic stress. So you got to make sure the adrenals are working well in order to support good androgen levels. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think a lot of women, you know, when their DHEA comes back low, it's really a simple solution to just take DHEA. But why is your DHEA so low, right? Exactly. So exactly. yeah, to look at the adrenals and understand that being overly stressed isn't affecting just the low DHEA, but it's pumping out cortisol. There's a lot of other things that could be going on that could be causing inflammation and, um, you know, snowball effects that need to be addressed as well. So that's, that's something, a good little hint for um, people who do find that they have low DHEA. But yeah, I like prescribing DHEA too. I know people, um, women in other countries don't have access to it. So I love that you also mentioned maca 
as a really good option. Uh, I love maca before I got pregnant with my girl, I was actually using it in smoothies, both Matt and I. So it's great for the man as well. Like, like you were saying, um, Jacqueline, that you can, um, you know, it boosts testosterone. So you can use it for men. And then also the tribulus as well it could go for women and men. So those yeah. are good alternatives to DHEA if you don't have access to it. Yeah. And then there's some food components that are um, aromatase inhibitors. Can you kind of say, like, tell us what aromatase inhibitors are, and then we can sure. just do a few things. So um, aromatase is an enzyme that breaks testosterone down and converts it into estrogen. So we talk about it more for men because it can become an issue for men as a way that they're like kind of draining too much testosterone and then growing man boobs instead with all the extra estrogen that they have around. But for women, you know, we go through that process to make estrogen, but that can happen too efficiently and it can drain our testosterone reserves. So uh, aromatase inhibitor is a compound that basically clogs up that enzyme so that the testosterone gets stuck as testosterone and can't convert to estrogen. You're still going to convert some. You can't really shut it down, even with the medication, but you'll do less conversion, which means you preserve your testosterone. So there's a lot of different compounds. Um, in different foods, like even button mushrooms contain mm-hmm. strong uh, Pinot Noir grapes, um, genesine from soy, uh, green tea extract. So a lot of these things are aromatase inhibitors, collard greens. So you can get them through food or through herbs too to help to try to kind of slow that blood process down. Perfect. And then I think green tea was also a big one that helps with several of the topics that we're going to be talking about. So I loved the idea that green tea kept coming up. Yeah, Um, definitely. And I I will say there was new research recently. I don't know if you came across this. It was like in the last month uh, where green tea extract or EGCG, which is a common supplement, one I prescribe very frequently. uh, It turns out that for some patients it can actually raise their liver enzymes and cause a little bit of concern to the liver. We don't see that with tea when you drink the whole tea. So generally with green tea, I'm not giving it as a supplement anymore, but I am still recommending that people do it as a tea and drink. You know, you can drink five or six cups a day of green tea. Yes. And, you know, some people might be thinking right now that they hate green tea (laughs) and because I was one of those people, but I learned, I think I watched like a Netflix documentary about tea and they emphasized how important it was to take the tea bag out once it's done steeping. So you got to really read the instructions and remove the tea bag out with green tea. And oftentimes it's like one minute or two minutes, and then you got to move it or take it out because it becomes very bitter and gross. Yeah, so, bitter and astringent, all these tannins come out. Mm-hmm. And, and the thing about green tea is it's kind of like a base neutral flavor. So if you don't like green tea on its own, you could try like green tea with pomegranate, green tea with peach, green chai. There's so many different kinds of teas out there now. And in our house, we actually make them and ice them a lot. And we drink a lot of it iced. And we get really creative. Like we make, uh, we will brew green tea and then use that tea to make rice rather than just water or chicken broth. And that adds a whole new flavor to rice, but it's really, really good, especially a jasmine green. It makes a nice flavor for the rice and you get it that way. Or, you know, there's so many different ways to get that in. So, Yeah. Really good point. I'm going to have to do that. I, I feel like sometimes my creative powers go out the windows. And so thank you for inspiring. Yeah. Green tea rice. Who knew it's so good. Yeah. (laughs) That's amazing. Okay. So we're going to move on to the second one, which is oxidative stress and carbonyl stress, Mm -hmm. which I don't think we've ever mentioned on the podcast, carbonyl stress. So if you can explain what that means to us. So oxidative stress, most people have heard of before. It's like the opposite of your antioxidants, or it's why we have antioxidants or why we need them. Oxidative stress can be caused by our own metabolism, right? It can be caused by things from the outside world, like pollutants, but you always have this going on in your body and it's okay. You need oxidative stress. In fact, ovulation requires oxidative stress to happen. Sperm wouldn't swim if there wasn't oxidative stress. We need it for metabolism, but too much of a good thing, it becomes a bad thing. And so um, when there's too much oxidative stress around, it actually can cause damage to cells. And that's the primary way that cancer happens to cells as well. 
but that damage can also harm eggs and sperm. And it's the one, the one cause we probably know the most about. So oxidative stress, you need to combat with different kinds of antioxidants. Now, carbonyl stress is similar to oxidative stress, but it's, it happens when there's oxidative stress in a high sugar environment. And when those two things are combined, you actually can have sugars added onto your fat proteins that cause permanent damage to those fats in those proteins. And that's like a double whammy. And that, that's basically oxidative stress on steroids is kind of how I would think about it. But um, have you ever grilled with like a nice sweet barbecue sauce and you get that black char on the meat? That wouldn't normally happen if the barbecue sauce wasn't there. That is actually carbonyl stress happening on your meat. And then we eat it, which, you know, isn't a good thing because that's harmful. But that you get what are called AGEs or age, appropriately shortened for age, or advanced glycosylated end products. And that's permanently changing the protein to add sugar, and they're pretty harmful. So you have to be really cautious. This is why we recommend a, a diet that's very balanced, that would be what we would call low glycemic or like lower in sugar, um, because you want to decrease the carbonyl stress on the body. That's a really good explanation. And we've emphasized definitely on the podcast, um, blood sugar control. And it's a big part of what we, um, use with our clients is kind of a low glycemic Mediterranean or paleo type of diet. So now we know why, right? That's one big reason why is to, is not only to control the insulin levels, but to also control the carbonyl stress that could be happening. It's unfortunate that, uh, carbonyl, um, or the mallard reaction, right? The the uh, glucose and the protein um, cooking together, it tastes so good. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's like when you, when you have eat toast, bad. right? <laughs> yeah, it's really too bad. But we should be limiting how much we consume and also, you know, trying to make an environment in our body that's not going to have that same kind of reaction. Right. Yeah. And if, you know, if it, it's any consolation, you do it for the time being when you're preparing for pregnancy and during pregnancy and maybe even during breastfeeding, but, um, it doesn't have to be forever, you know, but that would be, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so with carbonyl stress, um, I know that you mentioned also before that, why does it affect the ovaries specifically? Like you mentioned that there's lower antioxidants in our ovaries. Yeah, well, we don't have great blood flow to our ovaries, so we're already at a little bit of a challenge there um, when it comes to any nutrients getting in or any waste getting out. But our ovaries are also under a lot of oxidative stress. The cells that we want to use have been there since birth. So while we're constantly regenerating cells everywhere in our body, within our ovaries, we're trying to use follicles that are you know, older than you are chronologically, You know, add nine months to that. Um, so it, it is tougher to kind of preserve good quality or kind of protect your ovaries there. That's and, um, yeah. And I mean, that kind of brings us into the next reason for poor egg quality, which is that those cells don't have any kind of DNA regenerating capability. So, um, men, as you know, men can have babies up until they're like seventies and eighties because they're constantly making more sperm. And the reason why they make more sperm is that the cells they come from called germ cells in men produce this enzyme called telomerase. Now DNA, if you remember back to like high school biology class, you know, you have this DNA coil and at the very end of it is this cap called a telomere. And every time the DNA replicates, the telomere gets shorter and shorter and shorter. Remember this from class? Oh yeah. A lot of time ago, we got to go back to the recesses of our brain, but most cells don't express telomerase, which actually kind of adds a little bit of the cap back on with every replication. So sperm cells do, which is why men can use um, their germ cells to make sperm until later, later, later in life, but egg cells and ovarian cells do not. So we don't get that benefit of that kind of protection from our genes. So our telomeres shorten, uh, and that's another thing that kind of leaves us more susceptible over time. Yeah, and you've mentioned too that our telomeres are already shortening at at birth, right? Yeah. In, in the yeah. ovaries, so they're already kind of disintegrating <laughs> before we're even born per se. So yeah. it's really important to protect those. And that brings us into the other really actually fourth um, 
assault on our ovaries is the mitochondrial defects. And that really plays into the telomere shortening and the oxidative stress. And so if you can talk to us about what are the mitochondria and why are they so significant in our ovaries? So I promise you, you learned about mitochondria in high school. You probably don't remember them, but back remember when you had to like do the model of a cell and you had the Golgi bodies and all those different organelles in the cell, mitochondria are one of the most important organelles inside of every cell. And the reason why they're so important is that they produce energy for the cell. And they're responsible. They have like two membranes. They have to shift chemicals across those membranes to produce energy. But every cell needs energy. It's how we make ATP, that basic building block of energy. But the ovarian cells actually need a ton more energy. Same with the epididymis in men. Those two um, tissues in the body actually have way more mitochondria than any other cell in the body. In fact, um, I always remember learning, and even in medical school, that heart cells have tons of mitochondria because the heart always needs to pump. It's always using energy. Do you remember learning about that? Yeah, I, I think, think I have even... 10,000 mitochondria per cell. And, and believe it or not, over, ovaries have like 200,000 copies yeah. of mitochondria per cell. It's like you know, 20 times. Am I doing my math right or embarrassing I think myself? it's even like 200 times. times, times I'm at the number, yeah. yeah. So you know, we have so many more mitochondria in our ovaries because we need that energy to protect the cells. Same with in the testicles so that they can protect the sperm. And a lot of us struggle with energy production on a mitochondrial level. There's a lot of nutrients that can be helpful, though, to help to preserve that and help us make energy more efficiently. But when that energy production goes down, that stresses the cells, and then that can lead to a quality decline also. Yeah, and with mitochondria, because they are making energy, they also produce a lot of reactive oxygen species. That's right. Yeah, so we need to be able to basically protect ourselves from our own metabolism. Yeah. I think that's so fascinating. So that brings us to, you know, most people in the fertility world, um, when they're trying to get pregnant or they've been struggling for a little bit, have heard of CoQ10. Can you tell us how that relates to why that helps us get pregnant? Yeah. So CoQ10 actually has like a double benefit because it's an antioxidant. So it helps with oxidative stress, but it also supports mitochondrial function. Um, if we look at how it transports energy in and out of the mitochondria, CoQ10 is needed in order to help to shuttle that back and forth and be efficient with it. So you need CoQ10 in order to do that. And we make that in our body. We have CoQ10 that we make, but for most of us, we don't have enough. So supplementing CoQ10 can be really helpful for egg quality because it helps with mitochondria and it helps with oxidative stress. So typically the dosing you'd start around 100 milligrams. Um, but research actually goes up to 600 milligrams per day. I rarely put people on that much, uh, but there is data out there and it, it can be beneficial. Yeah. And it could be, it could be a little expensive too, once you get to 600 yeah. <laughs> milligrams. Definitely. So what I, what the research I've done, generally the CoQ10 you find costs about a dollar for a hundred milligram dose. So that will put it in perspective when you're price shopping. I use ubiquinol, which is the most active form of CoQ10. And right. that's what I prefer to prescribe in my practice. But if you're finding it at a price that's, you know, around a dollar per day or a dollar per hundred milligrams, that's good. But if you were going to do 600 milligrams, that's $6 a day. That's like almost $200 a month for just CoQ10. So that's why I don't yeah. joke that high. I use other things as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of the fertility clinics now are uh, pushing it up to about 600, especially if you're on the older, you know, late thirties, early forties. Right. And, but it could be really helpful. And so with mitochondria, so once again, our ovaries have 200,000 mitochondria, little engines inside their, their cells. So that's just amazing. Now, the way I kind of think about it too, is you're kind of filling up the gas tank when you're, you're giving the, the cells what they need, right? Like these antioxidants, because what, once they start to divide, they need a lot of energy, right? So they're, they're about to go on a long trip and they're going to be dividing and dividing and dividing. And all that dividing is requires a lot of energy. And when they don't quite have that energy in place, um, or the gas to do it, then mistakes happen. 
Um, and so oftentimes that looks like maybe three chromosomes versus one. So that's like trisomy or, you know, down syndrome. Those are that that's what happens when you're the cell can't quite divide perfectly the way it wants to. I love that explanation. Yeah, I think it's perfect. Awesome. Okay. So let's talk about a couple more things that we can um, do to help support egg quality. So um, we talked about low glycemic Mediterranean diet. I love that. We talked about green tea Mm -hmm. and the best way to drink green tea. (laughs) Um, Exercise is always a good option. I think most people hopefully understand that by now. Um, Let's talk about melatonin. What is the newest research with melatonin? Well, melatonin, believe it or not, I mean, every, not everyone, most people have heard of melatonin, but we primarily think of it for what? Sleep. For sleep, right? For sleep. And, you know, melatonin is a super safe sleep aid. Um, They've even tested it in neonates. You know, it's found to be safe. We make it by our body and it's produced by the brain, but it's also a great antioxidant, believe it or not. So, you know, maybe that's an extra function of melatonin being released at night is that it does help us sleep, but it also is released in a way that it can help us regenerate while we're sleeping. Mm. So melatonin is really helpful for egg quality also. And it's another nutrient or it's a hormone actually that's been tested in research in the IVF environment, just giving three milligrams at bedtime, which is the normal dose of melatonin you'd find in the sleep aid. It can actually help to boost egg quality. Um, Now you could use higher doses too, believe it or not, uh, melatonin has been used in certain kinds of cancers at 20 mm-hmm. milligrams per day because it can actually help chemotherapy regimens work better and help to protect cells. So don't do that if you have cancer, unless you're under the guidance of someone who knows what they're doing far more than I do for right. cancer. You know? But um, and what it does show us is that it's a really potent antioxidant. So that would be another pretty safe thing that could be added in um, that could help boost egg quality. Awesome. I love that. Some people don't do so well with melatonin. They feel really groggy the next day. Um, would you suggest that we can kind of go down in dose a little bit or even up in dose? I mean, I think it's really individual how people might uh, react to melatonin. Yeah. The other thing I see is vivid dreams, like not necessarily scary dreams, but when you wake up and you're like, wow, that was like really yeah. real. And, you know, that person <laughs> was a trip. Was right there next to me. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh gosh, did that really happen or not happen? Um, so sometimes that can be disruptive and those people, I just use something different. You know, I don't generally try a lower dose because remember we want the antioxidant function. So right. if you cut it in half, you know, you're only going to get half the benefit, but there's so many other antioxidants we can use instead, um, that I'll just kind of lean more heavily on those. Okay, perfect. Let's talk about those a little bit. I wanted to talk about alpha lipoic acid. Mm-hmm. Great. So there are a ton of great antioxidants out there. And before we dive into any one in particular, I like to kind of lay the framework with antioxidants that a rainbow is best, right? And what I mean by that is that there have been studies on certain antioxidants that show that when you get to high levels, some people don't respond very well to it. For example, excuse me, there was a study that had come out around prostate cancer patients who took high dose vitamin E. And while vitamin E was protective for some people at high doses, it actually caused more damage to them. So, you know, generally what we find is at low doses, antioxidants are great for everybody, but for some people at high doses with certain nutrients, and it's of course hard to know how you're going to respond ahead of time, then you start to kind of tip that scale of balance and get a little bit of harm from it. So when I'm trying to help patients by giving them more antioxidants, I like to give lower amounts of a wide variety of antioxidants instead of high doses of any single one. Um, And the research shows across the board with many different conditions that that I call it like a blanket approach or a rainbow approach seems to work best. So I always start with diet because of that, because when you're eating food, if you're eating a lot of plant-based foods, that's where we're going to find most of our antioxidants naturally um, is in plants, particularly plants with a strong smell or a strong color, or a strong flavor. Um, So what we think about that is fruits and vegetables. And then the other place we get it is culinary spices, like garlic and onions and oregano and thyme and basil and rosemary. All of those naturally contain lots of antioxidants. So I always start with the foundation of eating the rainbow. You know, make sure that every week you get all the colors. 
naturally, not Skittles. They don't count. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's what my kids say. I had a rainbow. Can you know? Can we just get some Skittles and I'll get them all Those covered? Kids. <laughs> yes. um, but you know, a rainbow of fruits and veggies. And then even if you're already eating fruits and vegetables, you probably could do a better job spicing your food. So, you know, if your spices are old, throw them away and get new ones and then use them, right? Use them. So make sure that your food is like very flavorful and that's going to help you get more antioxidants before we even add any supplements. Yes, I actually, I love that. And I remember you referring it to planty oxidants. Yeah, I call them planty oxidants. <laughs> yeah, the plant oxidants because it's so true. And many of the antioxidants that we know now that are bottled up in supplements, we've found and named, and there's some studies on them and they're all amazing, but there's also tons of compounds and plants that haven't been named. We don't know what they are. We, all we know is that there's a synergistic effect that's happening in the body that, um, you know, the liver is, is using and, um, the cells are using, the blood is using, the lymph is using that, you know, when you just only give one, the body is like, you know, it's, it's like, you're only giving one piece of the puzzle. Like it really needs more. And so that's what it made me think of when you talked about the prostate cancer and the vitamin E it's like, well, if you're only giving vitamin E, but what about vitamin A and vitamin D and vitamin C and B6 and B12, you know, like you really do need, the whole thing. So diet is absolutely number one. And what I try to do with my own diet, which is always a challenge every day, but it's kind of a fun challenge is um, to get two cups of non-starchy vegetables in like the rainbow um, three times a day. So trying to get like those six cups of non-starchy vegetables. And even as you know, a naturopath and somebody who very much values diet, it's, it's, a tough goal, especially since we're so busy and, um, you know, we're trying to make our own food and eat a whole foods diet. And so that means there's a lot of prep work involved, but it's a fun goal to, to go for. And then I, I absolutely know when I hit that six cup mark, like I feel amazing the next day I sleep really yeah. well. You can really, really feel the difference yeah. um, pretty immediately. I'm big on veggies at breakfast. That's how I started out with like a power pack breakfast. So in our house, you know, we either do smoothies in the morning where we're loading in different veggies also in addition to fruit, or I'll do like an egg scramble. And I think egg scrambles are like way underrated because basically you make a vegetable stir fry <clears throat> and then you like throw a couple eggs in to hold it together. And we'll use up, like we'll cook extra veggies at night and the night before. That way we can just throw those in the next day. So this morning we had like broccoli and onion in ours because that's what we had left over from dinner. So that's yeah. one easy way to kind of get a jump on that. Um, and you know, there's always kale, but it's nice to mix it up too. Uh, and you can kind of, you know, throw yeah, I, st I steam kale in my baby food maker. That's my, like I secretly just, Perfect. Like, okay, there's my two cups right there. Greens um, are great because they curry. shrink down so much. What'd you say? Greens are great because they just shrink down so much. Exactly. Yeah. I had a big, beautiful head of Swiss chard that I bought last night and it was kind of funny because I chopped it all up and it filled up the whole bowl. And then I just had this pan that I started throwing it all into. And I was like, this seems like a lot. I couldn't, I couldn't put the lid on the top of the lid on it, but I was like, Oh, just give it about 30 seconds and it's going to shrink all the way down. And it really, really shrunk down. And we ended up eating um, three fourths of that whole head of um, greens and it just felt amazing. And in fact, my, my daughter actually liked it, which was really weird. Yeah, good. <laughs> when you find those winning recipes, you got to stick with it when you've got kids. Oh yeah, absolutely. So that's amazing. So some other, um, antioxidants. So you like to use combo low dose antioxidants, things like, um, quercetin, rutin. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that you can bump up the antioxidants and support egg quality. Yeah. So I know you mentioned alpha lipoic acid. That's a great um, antioxidant. There's others that I turn to a lot like N-acetylcysteine is another one. I love that one. We've mentioned that a few times. Yeah. N-acetylcysteine has good research because it's an antioxidant of, on its own, but it also is a precursor to glutathione, um, which is our master antioxidant that we make. So that one, again, it's like a a precursor backbone, but it also has a direct positive action. So 
that one, the dosing is usually like 1200 to 1800 milligrams per day. It's pretty high dose. Mm-hmm. And that works great. Um, I also love glutathione, which I use directly. There's no clinical research on that that I've seen yet. Although there's a lot of research showing that the eggs and the sperm are better quality when there's more glutathione around. Um, but we have not seen research come out where when you supplement glutathione orally that you get benefit. But I see it clinically a lot. So I use that at you know around 1 to 200 milligrams per day. Okay. And with your glutathione, are you doing like a liquid or supplement form? Or is there like a favorite route that you like to use? Well, IV has a lot of research, but I don't generally recommend IV because it's just needles and appointments and not as easy to do for people consistently. So there's a couple different forms. Um, I usually recommend what's called a reduced glutathione, and you'd see that on the label. Uh, And that's taken orally. So it's an oral capsule. There are liquids available too. Um, There's one that I like that you can put underneath your tongue and it's a couple of pumps. And that is nice. Generally, especially with fertility, I don't know if you find this too, but if you are really working with a couple that has a lot going on, it can be a lot of capsules per day. And I'm really cognizant because I hate swallowing capsules. I'm like the naturopath who won't take pills, (laughs) even vitamins. I mean, I do because I have to but I'm a minimalist personally. Um, You know, my husband's the opposite. Like literally I fill our little trays for the week and he'll take the whole handful with no drink and like pop it in his mouth and swallow. And I'm very jealous. It's actually like one of the few things where I am like jealous because I don't have that ability. And (laughs) Uh, with me, I'm like gagging with every single pill. I have to do it with juice or like soda through a straw or you know, they're really hard. For oh, I'm sure we have a lot of listeners that are like, yes, yes, yes. That's me. That's me. That's me. Yeah. So yeah. So in that so case, like anything I can do is a liquid. Anything I can do is a powder or a liquid. I like to have those options mm-hmm. because that would be best for me. So I'm, you know, I'm trying yeah. to think about what would work. So the liquid glutathione is a pump. It has to stay in the refrigerator. So it's a little bit finicky, um, but it, that can be another nice option for people that don't want to have, take as many pills. Vitamin D yeah. is like one that's easy as a liquid. Uh, fish oil I love as a liquid. And there's some good fish oils out there too that actually taste yummy now. Um, I know you don't believe me, but it's true. <laughs> there's some good options out there for liquids. <laughs> yeah, Nordic Naturals is a good one. Um, seeking Health. We we talk about Seeking Health. I like how Dr. Ben Lynch, which we are going to be having on the podcast here um, coming up, and he made a uh, powdered prenatal, which is really like he gives additional dosing options, which is really awesome. So you don't yeah. have to just take a pill, especially because his actual capsule prenatal is like eight Six capsules a day. day. A day. Yeah, I, I have eight. that one in my cabinet, but I can't <laughs> yeah. take all eight. So like I used to do, um, you know, I would take my regular prenatal, which was like a two or three a day, then I'd add one of those in or something because I it's yeah. hard to take all eight, but it's a great comprehensive one. With fish yeah. oil, some of my favorites are like, for people who don't like fish oils, the company Barleen's makes smoothie forms and they make some that are like key lime or strawberry and they're oh. so they're not as high dose and they're definitely like more expensive to get the dose you need, but they taste great. Um, and so that's one option. And I really think that a big issue with fish oil liquid is actually not the flavor. It's the texture of an oil. Like if you were to take a teaspoon or tablespoon of olive oil, you'd probably think that was gross too, just because we're not used to that fatty mouthfeel. Um, and so yeah. some of the tricks I've seen, because I used to do a ton of pediatrics, is I'd have the parents pour the fish oil over some popcorn and then the kids would eat it. And like, you could do that yourself as a grown up. And I swear, like you really can't taste it. It just tastes a little bit lemony. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a that's interesting. Then then you can have popcorn every night because you have to take fish oil every day. <laughs> or the other one I love is by Thorn Research. So Thorn makes um, their fish oil liquids a little bit different. They're called Omega Superb, and they add astaxanthin, which is a nice antioxidant. That's how they preserve it, um, mm. which is an antioxidant in and of itself that I love to prescribe. So it makes it red, um, and the flavor is I the one I get is lemon berry, but I forget the second flavor. But they also add stevia to the oil. So it's actually sweet and it tastes really nice. Like it's a very, very nice tasting oil and it's not super thick. So if I have to do liquids, it costs a little bit more to do mm-hmm. that thorn versus like, I like Carlson's as a good standard oil that you can get even at Whole Foods or anywhere. Um, but if you have the extra money, that the thorn one is a great one that has a really nice flavor to it. And I very rarely have people have a problem with that. 
Oh, that's amazing. Thank you so much for all those tips. I know people have a really hard time with fish oil. I've been trying to take cod liver oil. Um, oh. It's awful. <laughs> oh, it's so awful. Yeah. Yeah. My mother is like, it's fine. You you know, the whole mother and the cod liver oil, even at age 35 now, she's like, it doesn't go away. Cod liver oil. (laughs) I'm just like, I can't do it. So yeah. Well, thank you so much. This was amazing. I cannot wait uh, for this to go out to the listeners. And then, um, the last thing I wanted to see if you wanted to give the listeners uh, any information about your class coming up and um, want to sure. give a shout out for your class. Sure. So I do a lot of teaching, you know, for patients and also for other doctors. So um, my business is called Perfect Fertility, it's perfectfertility.com. And under clinician trainings, there's a lot of trainings that are coming up that are pre-recorded that you can get access to, but we're actually doing a live webinar on May 11th, Saturday. Uh, where we'll be, it's eight hours. So like bring a nice cup of green tea, whatever your choice of green tea is and listen in. And we go through soup to nuts, really everything you need to be a competent clinician when it comes to an integrative naturopathic functional approach to fertility. So I know Dr. Haley, you've taken the course before, so maybe you'll have perks to say, but it, um, we cover evaluation for men and women. We cover preconception care, we cover the details of how to work someone up and not just the basics, but, you know, for example, we talked about the standard labs we'd run for egg quality. We talk in this course about how to dig deeper to know, well, what is it? Is it androgens? Is it oxidative stress? Is it mitochondria? You know, how do you figure out what's actually going on? Um, and then we talk about all the major causes of infertility from PCOS and egg quality and all the different major causes and how to treat them naturopathically. So it's a it's a long day for everybody, but it goes by quick and it's really fun. And it's always a passionate group of clinicians. So yeah, it's there. amazing. Um, would you, is there any particular type of practitioner or physician that you would recommend this to? Can anybody take it or? Anyone can take it. I've even had really knowledgeable patients sign up for it, but it is geared to someone who has um, like a, a good solid background in medicine. So you know, you, if you don't know the hormones of the menstrual cycle, part of it might be confusing when we talk about that. And um, we do assume a base level of knowledge. So it's intended for, you know, you know chiropractors, naturopathic doctors, um, nutritionists, medical doctors who really want to get that edge on the kind of integrative approaches there. Yeah. I absolutely love the course. I refer back to it all the time. This podcast is really a highlight of what you find in the course. It's just jam-packed of good information. And um, I would highly recommend it if you happen to be in the medical field and you would like to learn more and know exactly how you can help other people um, master their fertility. So for the plot. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jacqueline Chassie for being on today. And, uh, we look forward to hopefully having you on again. Thank you. This has been awesome and keep up the great work helping people, you know, understand how they can get pregnant even without the need for like high medical intervention. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much for joining us for that amazing interview with Dr. Jacqueline Chassie. I absolutely learned a ton. Hopefully you did as well. I love talking about egg quality. I think it's really important for women to know how they can support support their egg quality as they get older, especially as we uh, are waiting to have children. We should be able to maximize our fertility well into our early 40s. And um, this is part of the information to know in order to do that. Okay. And lastly, do remember that we have a free fertility recovery guide uh, that helps support you in five different categories in diet and lifestyle to get started. If you're currently trying to conceive or if you're planning to in the next year, you can download that at our website at tinyfeet.co forward slash podcast, and then look for Dr. Jacqueline Chassie's interview. It's episode 27. And we will have the links there where you can download your free fertility recovery guide. And lastly, join us over on Instagram at tinyfeet.co. And we're also on Facebook at tinyfeet.co where we're doing live video chats every week on Wednesday to talk about the podcast and also answering any questions that you might have. And those and that's going to be every Wednesday, approximately around noonish Pacific time. 
All right. And we hope to see you back next week. Thanks again.